Chapter 30 The more I knew of the inmates of Morehouse, the better I liked them. In a few days, I had so far recovered my health that I could sit up all day and walk out sometimes. I could join with Diana and Mary in all their occupations, converse with them as much as they wished, and aid them when and where they would allow me. There was a reviving pleasure in this intercourse, of a kind now tasted by me for the first time, the pleasure arising from perfect congeniality of tastes, sentiments, and principles. I liked to read what they liked to read. What they enjoyed delighted me. What they approved, I reverenced. They loved their sequestered home. I, too, am the gray, small, antique structure with its low roof, its latticed casements, its moldering walls, its avenue of aged firs, all grown aslant under the stress of mountain winds, its garden dark with yew and holly, and where no flowers but of the hardiest species would bloom, found a charm both potent and permanent. They clung to the purple moors behind and around their dwelling, to the hollow vale into which the pebbly bridle path leading from their gate descended, and which wound between fern banks first, and then among a few of the wildest little pasture fields that ever bordered a wilderness of heath, or gave sustenance to a flock of grey moorland sheep, with their little mossy-faced lambs. They clung to the scene, I say, with a perfect enthusiasm of attachment. I could comprehend the feeling, and share both its strength and truth. I saw the fascination of the locality. I felt the consecration of its loneliness. My eye feasted on the outline of swell and sweep, on the wild coloring communicated to ridge and dell by moss, by heath bell, by flower-sprinkled turf, by brilliant bracken and mellow granite crag. These details were just to me what they were to them. So many pure and sweet sources of pleasure, the strong blast and the soft breeze, the rough and the house on day, the hours of sunrise and sunset, the moonlight and the clouded night developed for me in these regions. The same attractions as for them wound round my faculties the same spell that entranced theirs. Indoors we agreed equally well. They were both more accomplished and better read than I was, but with eagerness I followed in the path of knowledge they had trodden before me. I devoured the books they lent me, then it was full satisfaction to discuss with them in the evening what I had perused during the day. Thought fitted thought, opinion met opinion. We coincided, in short, perfectly. If in our trio there was a superior and a leader, it was Diana. Physically, she far excelled me. She was handsome. She was vigorous. In her animal spirits, there was an affluence of life and certainty of flow, such as excited my wonder while it baffled my comprehension. I could talk a while when the evening commenced, but the first gush of vivacity and fluency gone, I was fain to scent on a stool at Diana's feet to rest my head on her knee and listen alternately to her and Mary while they sounded thoroughly the topic on which I had but touched. Diana offered to teach me German. I liked to learn of her. I saw the part of instructress pleased and suited her, that of scholar pleased and suited me no less. The nature's dovetailed mutual affection of the strongest kind was the result they discovered i could draw their pencils and color boxes were immediately at my service my skill greater in this one point than theirs surprised and charmed them mary would sit and watch me by the hour together then she would take lessons and a docile intelligent assiduous pupil she made thus occupied and mutually entertained days passed like hours and weeks like days as to mr st john the intimacy which had arisen so naturally and rapidly between me and his sisters did not extend to him. One reason of the distance yet observed between us was that he was comparatively seldom at home. A large proportion of his time appeared devoted to visiting the sick and poor among the scattered population of his parish. No weather seemed to hinder him in these pastoral excursions. Rain or fall, he would, when his hours of morning study were over, take his hat and, followed by his father's old pointer, Carlo, Go out on his mission of love or duty. I scarcely know in which light he regarded it. Sometimes, when the day was very unfavorable, his sisters would expostulate. He would then say, with a peculiar smile, more solemn than cheerful, And if I let a gust of wind or a sprinkling of rain turn me aside from these easy tasks, what preparation would such sloths be for the future I propose to myself? Diana and Mary's general answer to this question was a sigh and some minutes of apparently mournful meditation. But besides his frequent absences, there was another barrier to friendship with him. 
he seemed of a reserved and abstracted and even of a brooding nature. Zealous in his ministerial labors, blameless in his life and habits, he yet did not appear to enjoy that mental serenity, that inward content, which should be the reward of every sincere Christian and practical philanthropist. Often of an evening, when he sat at the window, his desk and papers before him, he would cease reading or writing, rest his chin on his hand, and deliver himself up to know not what course of thought, but that it was perturbed and exciting might be seen in the frequent flash and changeful dilation of his eye. I think, moreover, that nature was not to him that treasury of delight it was to his sister's. He expressed once, and but once in my hearing, a strong sense of the rugged charm of the hills, and an inborn affection for the dark roof and hoary walls he called his home. But there was more of gloom than pleasure in the tone, and words in which the sentiment was manifested. And never did he seem to roam the moor for the sake of their soothing silence, never seek out or dwell upon the thousand peaceful delights they could yield. Incommunicative as he was, some time elapsed before I had an opportunity of gauging his mind. I first got an idea of its caliber when I heard him preach in his own church at Morton. I wish I could describe that sermon, but it was past my power. I cannot even render faithfully the effect it produced on me. It began calm, and indeed, as far as delivery and pitch of voice went, it was calm to the end, and earnestly felt yet strictly restrained zeal breathed soon in the distant accents and prompted the nervous language. This grew to force, compressed, condensed, controlled. The heart was thrilled, the mind astonished, by the power of the preacher, neither were softened. Throughout there was a strange bitterness, an absence of consolatory gentleness, stern allusions to Calvinistic doctrines, election, predestination, reprobation were frequent, and each reference to these points sounded like a sentence pronounced for doom. When he had done, instead of feeling better, calmer, more enlightened by his discourse, I experienced an inexpressible sadness, for it seemed to me, I know not whether equally so to others, the, that the eloquence to which I had been listening had sprung from a depth where lay turbid dregs of disappointment, where moved troubling impulses of insatiate yearnings and disquieting aspirations. I was sure St. John Rivers, pure-lived, conscientious, zealous as he was, had not yet found that peace of God which passeth all understanding. He had no more found it, I thought, than had I with my concealed and wrecking regrets from my broken idol and lost Elysium, regrets to which I have latterly avoided referring, but which possessed me and tyrannized over me ruthlessly. Meantime, a month was gone. Diana and Mary were soon to leave Moore House and return to the far different life and scene which awaited them, as governesses in a large, fashionable South of England city, where each held a situation in families by whose wealthy and haughty members they were regarded only as humble dependents, and who neither knew nor sought out their innate excellences, and appreciated only their acquired accomplishments as they appreciated the skill of their cook or the taste of their waiting woman. Mr. St. John had said nothing to me yet, but the employment he had promised to obtain for me, yet it became urgent that I should have a vocation of some kind. One morning, being left alone with him a few moments in the parlor, I ventured to approach the window recess, which his table, chair, and desk consecrated a kind of study, and I was going to speak, though not very well knowing in what words to frame my inquiry, for it is at all times difficult to break the ice of reserve glassing over such nature as his, when he saved me the trouble by being the first to commence a dialogue. Looking up as I drew near, you have a question to ask of me, he said. Yes, I wish to know whether you have heard of any service I can offer myself to undertake. I found or devised something for you three weeks ago, but as you seemed both useful and happy here, as my sisters had evidently become attached to you, and your society gave them unusual pleasure, I deemed it inexpedient to break in on your mutual comfort, till their approaching departure from Marsh End should render yours necessary. And they will go in three days now, I said. Yes, and when they go, I shall return to the parsonage at Morton. Hannah will accompany me, and this old house will be shut up. I waited a few moments, expecting he would go on with the subject first broached. But he seemed to have entered another train of reflection. His look denoted abstraction from me and my business. I was obliged to recall him to a theme which was of necessity, one of close and anxious interest to me. What is the employment you had in view, Mr. Rivers? I hope this delay will not have increased the difficulty of securing it. Oh, no. 
since it is an employment which depends only on me to give and you to accept. He again paused. There seemed a reluctance to continue. I grew impatient. A restless movement or two, and an eager and exacting glance fastened on his face, conveyed the feeling to him as effectually as words could have done, and with less trouble. "'You need be in no hurry to hear,' he said. "'Let me frankly tell you. I have nothing eligible or profitable to suggest. Before I explain, recall, if you please, my notice, clearly given, that if I helped you, it must be as the blind man would help the lame. I am poor, for I find that when I have paid my father's debts, all the patrimony remaining to me will be this crumbling range.' the row of scathed firs behind and the patch of moorish soil with the yew trees and holly bushes in front. I am obscure. Rivers is an old name, but of the three sole descendants of the race, two are in the dependent's crust among strangers, and the third considers himself an alien from his native country, not only for life, but in death. Yes, and deems, and is bound to deem himself honored by the lot, and aspires but after the day when the cross of separation from fleshly ties shall be laid on his shoulders, and when the head of that church militant, of whose humblest members he is one, shall give the word, Rise, follow me. St. John said these words as he pronounced his sermons, with a quiet, deep voice, with an unflushed cheek, and a coruscating radiance of glance. He resumed, And since I am myself poor and obscure, I can offer you but a service of poverty and obscurity. You may even think it degrading, for I see now your habits have been what the world calls refined. Your tastes leaned the ideal, and your society has at least been amongst the educated. But I consider that no service degrades which can better our race. I hold that the more arid and unreclaimed the soil where the Christian laborer's task of tillage is appointed him, the scantier the mead his toil brings, the higher the honor. His, under such circumstances, is the destiny of the pioneer. And the first pioneers of the gospel were the apostles. Their captain was Jesus, the Redeemer, himself. Well, I said as he again paused, proceed. He looked at me before he proceeded. Indeed, he seemed leisurely to read my face, as if its features and lines were characters on a page. The conclusions drawn from this scrutiny he partially expressed in his succeeding observations. "'I believe you'll accept the post I offer you,' said he, "'and hold it for a while, not permanently, though, "'any more than I could permanently keep the narrow and narrowing "'the tranquil, hidden office of English country incumbent, "'for in your nature is an alloy as detrimental to repose "'as that in mine, though of a different kind. "'Do explain,' I urged when he halted once more. "'I will, and you shall hear how poor the proposal is, "'how trivial, how cramping.' I shall not stay long at Morton, now that my father is dead, and that I am my own master. I shall leave the place probably in the course of a twelve month, but while I do stay, I will exert myself to the utmost for its improvement. Morton, when I came to it two years ago, had no school. The children of the poor were excluded from every hope of progress. I established one for boys. I mean now to open a second school for girls. I have hired a building for the purpose, with a cottage of two rooms attached to it for the mistress's house. Her salary will be thirty pounds a year. Her house is already furnished, very simply, but sufficiently. By the kindness of a lady, Miss Oliver, the only daughter of the sole rich man in my parish, Mr. Oliver, the proprietor of a needle factory and iron foundry in the valley. The same lady pays for the education and clothing of an orphan from the workhouse, on condition that she shall aid the mistress in such menial offices connected with her own house and the school as her occupation of teaching will prevent her having time to discharge in person. Will you be this mistress? He put the question rather hurriedly. He seemed half to expect an indignant, or at least a disdainful rejection of the offer, not knowing all my thoughts and feelings, though guessing some. He could not tell in what light the lot would appear to me. In truth, it was humble, but then it was sheltered and I wanted a safe asylum. It was plodding, but then compared with that of a governess in a rich house, it was independent, and the fear of servitude with strangers entered my soul like iron. It was not ignoble, not unworthy, not mentally degrading. I made my decision. I thank you for the proposal, Mr. Rivers, and I accept it with all my heart. But you comprehend me, he said. It is a village school. Your scholars will be only poor girls, cottagers' children. At the best, farmers' daughters, Knitting, sewing, reading, writing, ciphering will be all you will have to teach. What will you do with your accomplishments? 
What with the largest portion of your mind, sentiments, tastes? Save them till they are wanted. They will keep. You know what they undertake, then? I do. He now smiled, and not a bitter or sad smile, but one well pleased and deeply gratified. And when will you commence the exercise of your function? I will go to my house tomorrow and open the school, if you like, next week. Very well, so be it. He rose and walked through the room. Standing still, he again looked at me. He shook his head. What do you disapprove of, Mr. Rivers? I asked. You will not stay at Morton long. No, no. Why? What is your reason for saying so? I read it in your eye. It is not of that description which promises the maintenance of an even tenor in life. I am not ambitious. He started at the word. Ambitious, he repeated. No. What made you think of ambition? Who is ambitious? I know I am. But how did you find it out? I was speaking of myself. Well, if you are not ambitious, you are... He paused. What? I was going to say impassioned, but perhaps you would have misunderstood the word and been displeased. I mean that human affections and sympathies have a most powerful hold on you. I am sure you cannot long be content to pass your leisure in solitude and to devote your working hours to a monotonous labor, wholly void of stimulus, any more than I can be content. He added with emphasis, to live here buried in morass, pent in with mountains, my nature that God gave me, contravened, my faculties, heaven bestowed, paralyzed, made useless. You hear now how I contradict myself, I who preached contentment with a humble lot, and justified the vocation even of hewers of wood and drawers of water in God's service. I, his ordained minister, almost rave in my restlessness. Well, propensities and principles must be reconciled by some means. He left the room. In this brief hour, I had learnt more of him than in the whole previous month. Yet still he puzzled me. Diana and Mary Rivers became more sad and silent as the day approached for leaving their brother and their home. They both tried to appear as usual, but the sorrow they had to struggle against was one that could not be entirely conquered or concealed. Diana intimated that this would be a different parting from any they had ever known. It would probably, as far as St. John was concerned, be a parting for years. It might be a parting for life. He will sacrifice all to his long-framed resolve, she said, natural affection and feelings more potent still. St. John looks quiet, Jane, but he hides a fever in his vitals. You would think him gentle, yet in some things he is inexorable as death, and the worst of it is my conscience will hardly permit me to dissuade him from his severe decision. Certainly I cannot for a moment blame him for it. It is right, noble, Christian, yet it breaks my heart, and the tears gushed to her fine eyes. Mary bent her head low over her work. We are now without father. We shall soon be without home and brother, she murmured. At that moment, a little accident supervened, which seemed decreed by fate purposely to prove the truth of the adage that misfortunes never come singly, and to add their distresses the vexing one of the slip between the cup and the lip. St. John passed the window reading a letter. He entered. Our Uncle John is dead, said he. Both the sisters seemed struck, not shocked or appalled. The tidings appeared in their eyes rather momentous than afflicting. Dead, repeated Diana. Yes. She riveted a searching gaze on her brother's face. And what then? She demanded in a low voice. What then, die? He replied, maintaining a marble immobility of feature. What then? Why, nothing. Read. He threw the letter into her lap. She glanced over it and handed it to Mary. Mary perused it in silence and returned it to her brother. All three looked at each other and all three smiled, a dreary, pensive smile, though. Amen. We can yet live, said Diana at last. At any rate, it makes us no worse off than we were before, remarked Mary. Only it forces rather strongly on the mind the picture of what might have been, said Mr. Rivers, and contrasts it somewhat too vividly with what is. He folded the letter, locked it in his desk, and again went out. For some minutes, no one spoke. Diana then turned to me. Jane, you will wonder at us and our mysteries, she said, and think us hard-hearted beings not to be more moved at the death of so near a relation as an uncle. But we have never seen him or known him. He was my mother's brother. My father and he quarreled long ago. It was by his advice that my father risked most of his property in the speculation that ruined him. Mutual recrimination passed between them. They parted in anger and were never reconciled. 
my uncle engaged afterwards in more prosperous undertakings. It appears he realized a fortune of twenty thousand pounds. He was never married and had no near kindred but ourselves and one other person, not more closely related than we. My father always cherished the idea that he would atone for his error by leaving his possessions to us. That letter informs us that he has bequeathed every penny to the other relation, with the exception of thirty guineas to be divided between St. John, Diana, and Mary Rivers for the purchase of three mourning rings. He had a right, of course, to do as he pleased, and yet a momentary damp is cast on the spirits by the receipt of such news. Mary and I would have esteemed ourselves rich with a thousand pounds each, and to St. John such a sum would have been valuable, for the good of it would have enabled him to do much. This explanation given, the subject was dropped and no further reference made to it by either Mr. Rivers or his sisters. The next day I left Marsh Inn for Morton. The day after, Diana and Mary quitted it for distant B. In a week, Mr. Rivers and Hannah repaired to the parsonage, and so the old grange was abandoned.